So hello and welcome to the Think Global Forum Roundtable event. We do appreciate you joining us today. As some of you may already know, uh, the Think Global Forum has been going for many years now, and we started off as an in-person conference-style events program running across many major cities in the USA, which we then expanded into Europe as well. Uh, typically, the format of a Think Global Forum, if you haven't joined us before, is we normally do these in uh, quite plush uh, hotels. And uh, we do them there where we, we're obviously in New York or London or Dublin, Chicago, Los Angeles, Amsterdam, many locations that we've hosted Think Global Forum conferences at. And to hold these in in-person events, we also host a boardroom style session as part of the Think Global Forum. Uh, which have proved to be uh, extremely popular. If you'd like to find out more about the Think Global Forum, I just wanted to say at the top before we get into today's discussion that you can do that at thinkglobalforum.org. So thinkglobalforum.org, if you want to find out a little bit more about the Think Global Forum. And the best way to keep uh, up to date with everything that's going on and whether they're in-person events, week-long summits that we do, or whether they are round tables. If you subscribe to the newsletter, that, that's normally a really good way to keep up to, up to speed with everything that we're doing. And of course, to follow us and follow the Think Global Forum on social media. Now, during the pa pandemic, we moved everything online, as did most people. And we changed the format to hosting these week-long summit events with many high profile keynote speakers. And we also did a few round tables as part of that, which worked really, really well. And we're currently planning at the moment to return to some in-person Think Global Forum events. It's a question that I'm constantly asked about. So we are working on that at the moment. And in addition to these events, of course, we're going to be commencing more virtual round table events that you're all joining us here today. Uh, we have a number of these roundtables planned, and to start us off, uh, we're joined by Jason Cooper today, who's going to share some insights into how storytelling impacts the brain. For those of you that aren't familiar with Jason's background, he's spent over 25 years at this stage helping many people and companies build value uh, through connections and effective relationships. He, he coaches and he trains uh, both individuals and whole sales departments on how to master relationships. And Jason is currently working extensively with Google, a brand I'm sure we all know. He's a certified trainer, he's a sales coach, and he's also somebody that's very focused on business strategy. So when it comes to storytelling, we're glad that Jason is here with us today to share some insights into how storytelling impacts the brain. We're also joined by Doyle Bueller today, and Doyle is a strategy Sherpa. Uh, he's a digital transformation expert, and he's the author of a book called Breakthrough, which helps to explore and unleash remarkable brand value, uh, influence, and authority. So it's great that we have Doyle with us today for the discussion. And we're also going to be joined in a little while by Tamir Kadar. And Tamir is the Chief Marketing Officer at Francis Cooper in London. She's a lecturer at the Northumbria University. And she's also the founder of the London Marketing Agency. And finally, Maria Roja and I here on the Think Global Forum team uh, will join Tamir, Doyle, and of course, Jason, following his presentation to discuss this topic about how storytelling impacts the brain in a little more detail. I do hope we're going to have some time to answer some Q&A from the audience, so feel free to drop any comments you might have into the chat or the, or the questions uh, function on this platform, and we'll do our best to answer some of those towards the end. So let's hand it over to Jason and let's begin the topic of how storytelling impacts the brain. J Jason, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Simon, as always, I always very much appreciate you inviting me. And uh, as we've known each other for the last few years, I um, understand Simon's business he's coming from i'm delighted to be here to present how storytelling affects our brains and before i go on 
uh, let me just see if I can share my screen and hopefully that will come up. Uh, if you give me a big thumbs up, uh, sharing my screen, I go across many different platforms and I get confused about which platform I'm on half the time, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Teams, whether it's whatever else. But really today is excellent. Thanks for that. It's storytelling and how it affects our brain. And it does in many ways. It's a lot of the things that we do, we speak to ourselves all the time and we tell ourselves stories all the time and narratives, whether it's true or whether it's not, we actually make up stuff in our heads, which is uh, fundamental to how the stories that are told to us in a narrative can affect our brain. But before we go any further, I've got to really uh, uh, make you understand the three areas of the brain, but I'll go through that. Look, this is me, like uh, Simon gave me a wonderful introduction. I also um, do a podcast, which is one of, uh, it's a global sales leader podcast. I've interviewed global leaders, people that at the top, at the top of their uh, um, business and their success in lives. So if you want to uh, listen to that. I'm more than happy to uh, share that with you if you want to connect with me uh, via LinkedIn or all the other social media platforms. Like, um, fundamentally, I'm a salesperson, but I've uh, along the way, I've actually got a whole load of skills. Now I train people in how to build effective business relationships with your clients and customer. But I'm also interested about the psychology behind that and the behaviors behind that and people's behaviors and body language and linguistics and also the stories that we tell. So that's fundamental to part of this, what I'm doing today is part of a bigger course that I actually present. But really, let's understand what she is. In the 1960s, a guy called uh, Paul McLean um, analyze an areas of the brain, but the brain is obviously very complex. So the three layer brain. So what is the three layer brain? Let's have a look. We have the neocortex, which is the outer layer of the brain, which takes pretty much 90% of how we think and how we do today. It's, our, it's like a, a central processing unit. So then we have the limbic system. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about that. It's what we see, what we feel, our beliefs, our values, and then we go into the root brain, which is the inner core of the brain, which is that green area. And that's pretty much our fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. Like when we see um, a snake, or back in the day, many years ago, thousands of years ago, we would see a dinosaur and we're with our tribe. We're either going to fight it, or we're going to flee, or we're going to freeze. But that's really powerful stuff that we have here. It's one of our uh, tools that parts of a brain that protects us. And, you know, that's all part and parcel of how a story can invoke the imagination of ourselves and of our people and of our uh, characters within a story. But let me carry on with that. So the neocortex, lots of different areas. Uh, there's the frontal cortex, the occipital, the temporal lobe. This is the thinking brain. This takes all of the data that we have around in our head. It's our logical, it's our rational thoughts, it's our language, it's our skepticism. It's also our judgment. It's how we judge things. It takes a huge amount of energy of our brain to actually process this. And again, the analogy is, as we always speak in analogies, it's the central processing unit of our brain. It takes a huge amount of energy to actually focus in on this area. So let's have a look at the limbic system. The limbic system is our feeling brain. It's the memory, it's a sociability, it's how our emotions are evoked, but really, and it's our trust and it's our visualization. So, this is a core area to how uh, part and parcel of how we are as humans. We are emotional beings. We're obviously logical, but that's the, the, the neocortex, the newest part of the brain. 
Then we're going to go back into the root brain again. It's our breathing, our hunger, our thirst, our balance, avoidance, and our survival. But again, it's here to protect us, and it's here for our safety. Remember thousands and thousands of years ago, I would say remember thousands of years ago, but none of us were there then. But if you're around the campfire and you had the leader of the tribe, the only way to get them to tell stories from generation to generation to generation is to sit around the fire and the leader would provoke all of this with wonderful stories and wonderful narratives that get passed down from generations two generations, two generations, whether they turn into myths or whether they turn into Chinese whispers or whether they get added on. But that's how we evoked with your imagination. And I'm gonna be speaking about that in a few moments. So how do we, I say it's the buying brain, but it's really, how do we affect people to change? So when I work with uh, professionals, business professionals and sales professionals, and other people like that, the only way I can get straight through to them, I could give them numbers and I can give them logic and I can give them all analytical information. But, you know, that's going to take time and effort for me to process that. And by that time, I've lost them. You know, when you're presented with lots of data, what actually happens to our brain? We take ages and ages and ages to think about things. So if you can connect with someone with a narrative, you work with the inside out, not the outside in. So you've got all the different areas of the brain. So when you present information, when you're doing a presentation, as an example, you don't go with lots and lots of data about, oh, we're wonderful, uh, we've increased the market by 5% and blah, 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 blah. No one wants to know that because you're not evoking any imagination in there. So once you do evoke the imagination, you have to go straight into the central information, the emotion to stir them, to actually buy into what you're suggesting, buy into the idea, you create those emotions. And we're gonna be speaking about that in a few moments, how that works. But I really wanted to make sure that you understand how our brain works. There's lots of different facets around that in a larger workshop, we'll talk about a lot more in data about how that works. Data, I said data, but I didn't mean to say data. But I want you to go into the chat if you can. What I want you to do when presented with, uh, uh, this was a study by the London School of Business. So there were three groups of students and they're all presented with different information. The first group was given information in statistics, statistical information. Then they asked them the next day how much they remembered. Can you put into the chat how much you think they actually remembered? Can we write into the chat how much do you think they actually remembered when they were presented in a story with data, lots of statistical data? This also goes in uh, with your presentations and what you do when you present to your clients and everything else. Can you put in there what it was? Can we get people to write into the chat? Not very much. Chat disabled. Oh, I apologize about that. Um, not very much, not very, very much. Uh, that goes, goes into the Q&A. Okay, the chat is disabled, but that's absolutely fine. I will keep on carrying on. So, between five and 10% the next day. So think about this when you present your presentations and you're putting lots and lots of data on, on the slide. This frustrates the hell out of me. If you're, if you're presenting slides, and you've got lots of graphs and you've got lots of words and you've got lots of everything else. Number one is going to go over most people's head. But what I'm passionate about is evoking that memory. So the second part, when you present the same stuff with the second group, they remembered with imagery. And that was 25%. 
that they remember the next day. So what do you think would be done on the, the third group and how much do you think they actually remembered? Uh, let me go into the Q&A. Chat, 20%. Anything else? You can put it into the Q&A. Oh, no, we got the chats open now. So 75%. Someone might have seen this before. So it is actually between 65 and 70%. What I want to do now is take this into another level. And what I mean is I've been studying this area on how visual language can evoke the imagination, can evoke your narrative even more. So I want to take it to another level. So what I want you to do is think of the last time you identified your very first memory or memory that came into mind of your last holiday. What I want you to start to think of is to see the world from a different perspective at the top of a high mountain or something like that. And then you're looking down, and this is from your last memory of your last holiday. Hopefully you all gone on the holiday. What you are doing is you're listening to children shrieking with pleasure as they shout excitedly to their friends. What I want you to remember to lay in on a warm beach, feeling fine, the sand granules running between your hands and your feet and through your fingers. And you're smelling the scents and the perfume of the clear night air as you walk through the restaurants, deciding where to go, deciding what to eat. And the unclouded fumes through the city or through the holiday resort or wherever you might be, savoring different fresh smells and tastes of sizzling foods as you decide what you need and what you'd like to eat. What I want you to do is, did you hear, did you smell, did you taste your memory? Because it's all about evoking your memory here. Chat is enabled here. Thank you, everyone. Chat is enabled. So what I just suggested, did you see, did you hear, did you smell your memory? Go back now and experience it through the rest of your senses. What did you feel when you were there? What did you touch? What senses are around you? And what did you smell and what did you touch? This all helps you to visualize and when we, uh, yeah, I'm hungry now. <laughs> yeah. As you were there, using our imagination first. So when we start to visualize using our language and our linguistics in the right way and using our sensory language to provoke the imagination of the other person as if you were there. This is all part of the story that you can tell. Water about me. Thank you, Anna. So let's take it a little bit further. So this is a loose framework that you can work with. And when I work with people, we break down this framework. So the setting. So this could be a business setting or if you're creating a story. So the setting is the office as an example. So the first part, the characters actually within the story. Um, it could be the characters, it could be yourself, it could be your customers, and you're there to present information to them. So this is part of it. So you're getting yourself ready to present your story. So what is the conflict? The conflict is trying to convince them to buy your product, your service, and they're going against it. Then all of a sudden, there's a big idea as you relate information, as you relate the story and the narrative to them. I always like to break it down into Star Wars myself. So number one, the first setting is um, Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia. They're all there in the setting. They're all shooting into the Death Star. The characters are, again, Luke Skywalker and it's Darth Vader 
and they're going in and they're the big conflict is the uh the, the dark entity versus um the jedi the big idea is to blow up the death star and the big resolution is they blow up the death star and they happily ever after but you can create this narrative you can create this rough idea of a story framework look it does give you flexibility there's a lots of different frameworks that you can use but in the business context in the sales context it gives you an idea of where you need to go and how you write the idea of how the business became what actually happened within the business and the narrative around that so let's go on. so the different areas who here understands what a metaphor is we use them all the time but subconsciously we just say them as soon as you start to speak to someone we're all using these metaphors all the time we're all using an analogy all the time who has the metaphor I'll give the game away. Uber is the taxi service while Airbnb is the hotel industry. So when you connect with people, this is another way of really connecting. So you're shortcutting straight to their memory and straight to their emotion. So they get it straight away. When you connect with a story, you connect with a metaphor or an analogy is another way round to it. So what is dopamine? Who knows here what dopamine actually is? So once you end a Netflix series or you're like me and yep, dopamine, and you're right there at the edge and you're in a certain high and you go, ah, oh, yes, excellent, excellent. Oh no, it's finished. So you get that instant high. You get that, um, you get that in lots of different areas. Uh, you get that watching TV. You get that what um, in other areas of your life. Yep, neurotransmitter. Thank you, Doyle. Uh, another neuroscience experts in there. Social media. Yep, dopamine. The brain releases dopamine to the system when it experiences an emotionally charged event. You can get that in sports. You can get that in lots of different areas. Well spoken about. How can we create dopamine? in the narrative that we say. The cortex activity, when processing facts, the information is activated. You know, we talk about the neocortex, but we want people to actually start to think about how the, the story is constructed and actually look back and just rest in their seat and go, wow, that's thought provoking. Makes you really sticky in the head. Makes you really sit back and go, wow, that was incredible. So sensory cortex and the frontal cortex, which is the frontal lobe, which is where the memory actually is. So how you can actually get people to remember you once you've left the area. So cortisol, which is really pretty much the stress course, which is me before I just started here today because Zoom updated and all of a sudden the stress course uh, actually hit my uh, head. So cortisol, the hormone released in responses to stress, which is caused on our, from our fight flight reaction, when we're scared, when there's nothing scary about the role, the cortisol in storytelling, we've all had that in the response to a uh, story or action story, uh, danger, risk, reward, but our brains are kicking in all the time. Too much cortisol is quite bad for you, but enough of it to just keep you there stressed and you're closing your eyes and you're watching something on the TV, but then you just keep looking because we like it in certain instances. And it's quite actually good for us in certain ways. It helps us to sweat in our palms through a movie or whatever it might be. Good storytelling really grabs your attention. But when you're presenting that to a client, you want to add in stress. You need to add in areas of stress, of loss, the uh, Chaldean's laws of influence and persuasion. If you put a little bit of stress in there, it does help, but not too much stress because that it does the negative effect. 
So let's have a look at mirror, mirror neurons, which is in the frontal lobe. People like people like themselves when you can connect with them. So your mirror neurons, which is in the frontal part of the brain, helps you see things from their point of view and all your point of view, depending on who's actually doing the speaking. So the mirror neurons are absolutely incredible. Again, when you're actually with a client and you're actually speaking to them and you send a narrative, your client will be jumping inside your brain and experiencing the same thing from their point of view when you've actually done that. Neurocoupling, a story activates parts of the brain that allows the listener to own the ideas. It's their idea. What you are doing is you're helping them create a visualization in their brain to make them understand it from their point of view. So the more you can create that within the neurocoupling area, the more it's going to work for you. So I'm going to quickly go through. Who knows what oxytocin is? You can put it into the chat if you want, if you want to have some interaction. The biggest part of oxytocin, the biggest area of oxytocin is, yep, yeah, absolutely. You actually took the words out of my mouth, used in childbirth. When a child is born to the world and the mother is flooded with oxytocin, it's the area of trust. It's the love hormone. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oxytocin comes into play in a story where you connect People like people like themselves, but they like connection. It's the experience and the hopes and desires of the dream of the plot. Even again, once you're having a wonderful time watching a movie on the on a TV, you can connect with your characters, especially those series that go on forever and a day, like Breaking Bad, which just goes up to eight or nine, ten episodes or series. And connecting, you like the people. It is the best drug. Well, I would say serotonin is one of my favorite drugs. And I ran this morning and I got huge amounts of serotonin, uh, which comes up. You get that flood of uh, serotonin when you're uh, in a crowd and you're watching a sporting event or you're watching uh, um, your, your favorite band. You get that flooding through. But that's me. That's what I like. But we're all slightly different. So positioning, how you position your story, how you start, how you present. You're creating emotions. You're creating your visual emotions. You're evoking the emotions. The only way you can really do that is using visual language, as we discussed before, and using your metaphorical influence around that to help them shortcut make them see things in a really quick way and you obviously how you explain things unifying you want to make sure that they remember you they want to make sure that they can talk about you to their clients to their their board members or whoever you're actually saying it to so they get it they understand it and they're emotionally connected to it and the attention story delivery always go first Show and tell, visualize your language, anchoring. What do I mean by anchoring? It's using specific words to put them so they remember certain things that they go bang. Oh, remember that. But we can go into a lot more detail about that. Be congruent. What is being congruent? We know that if you're presenting, your language, your tone, your tonality. I was speaking to a guy called Joe Navario the other day. Uh, he is the number one expert in the world of body language. He actually trains uh, the FBI and he trains other people like that. So there's a lot of statistical information out there. So your body language is around about uh, 55%. How you're using your arms, what goes on in your face, your eyes, it's that connection of trust when you actually say it. It's the congruence that meaning that if you're saying that you're open, your body language is open at the same time, and you actually smile with the eyes and people can actually see that connection, that trust that you are saying what you are saying is true. 
The next part is around about 30% of the tone, your tonality, how you speak, how you pace and how you pause. Then it goes by listening. But there's fluctuation between what is actually said and the actual percentages. Uh, and again, use your senses to help you. So quick, 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 quick thing I'm gonna do for you. Um, what I want you to do now, and I know I'm running out of time as always. So what I want you to do is remember everything on this list. You ready? Let's go. Ice cream. Lion. Empire State Building. TV. Umbrella. Train. Boxing contest. Irish flag. Wine. Paper plane. Wedding, snow, journal, pizza, Thailand, balcony, bath towel, diet coke. Okay, I'm actually gonna sit back here and if you can put in order, how much did you remember? Ice cream, 50%. Oh, that's good, Simon, well done. You probably wrote it down, didn't you? Anything else? 25% maybe. That's pretty good, that's pretty good. It's better than what I did the first time I did this. Can I watch the replay? <laughs> First five to six. Okay. Look, I'm going through this quite quickly because I know we are short of time. 75, 75%. Wow, you're incredible. So what I want you to do now is... Uh, I remember the time that I love... I was in New York and I loved when I get there is to have my favorite ice cream. And there's an ice cream parlor that I always go to and I get the best, best ice cream. Absolutely love it. So I have my ice cream, but then I walk around the big square there and I know there's a zoo there and my favorite animal is the lion. I always take my time walking around there while eating my ice cream and looking at the lion and as I look, I can see in the distance, the Empire State Building is another one of my favorite places to go and visit. So after I go there and I look at the Empire State Building and go, wow, that is incredibly high. I get very nervous and I get a little bit vertigo when I see the Empire State Building. But, you know, I can always watch it on the TV at any time. So I don't actually have to go up there. I can just watch it from afar. But that's one of the things that I, I, I probably would do because I get a little bit vertigo. But you know, like in Ireland, in New York, it does rain from time to time. I know at the moment they're, they're hot temperatures, but it, when it, at the moment I need to find the umbrella because it's thrown down with rain. And the subway is incredible this time of year, any time of year, to get onto the train and take a journey to different parts and different areas within New York. One of the areas that I remember last time is a big boxing match that I actually went to and I saw uh, two big contestants, and I can't remember their names now, but it was a fun fight, but it was good to actually watch them. Always, like I am English, but I've been living in Ireland for 18, 19 years now. So like I do fly the, the Irish flag. And again, as I was at the boxing match, I, I do like a little bit of wine every now and again, just to keep me going. It's one of the fun things that my son was doing the other day was actually creating paper airplanes. He actually created so many of them. Uh, I, I, I had to bin them 
but uh, he created too many of them. But that's just a, by the sideline. And when we were in Central Park, we did actually see a wedding. And in wintertime, we know how much it snows. Uh, it's like ridiculously bad. And within the journal, within the streets, they always have those guys that are actually giving the, uh, the, the latest journals and the latest papers and everything else. Again, New York is famous for its pieces. One of the places that I want to jump to next is Thailand. And I've been to Thailand many times. But I was watching that from the TV, from the balcony on the TV about the place that I love to go while wrapping around with my bathrobe and drinking Diet Coke. So how much did you remember? How much did you remember? From the first time to the second time. Much more, much more. And you know much more is because 70%. Story helps. Thank you. So I created a narrative around that to evoke your imagination, to evoke your memory, so you remember more about the story and everything else. So that is absolutely powerful. So the story of Virgin is these ups and downs, the opportunity and challenges, what's attracting people to our products and services. And we also work with us. We all should be nothing without our story. Virgin, we know, is a massive story. And Richard Branson tells his story and his narrative extremely well. Thank you, Sir Richard Branson. This is me, I'm done. I've condensed uh, a half, uh, half a day's workshop within 40 minutes. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna stop presenting. If you wanna find out more from me, visit my website, jasoncooper.io. Connect with me on LinkedIn, um, at jcooper1970. Please connect with me. If you want to find out more for what I do and how I represent and how I can make you more connectable, trustable, credible in front of your clients. And Simon, back to yourself. Well, thank you, Jason. That was a whirlwind tour of storytelling. There was so much information packed in there. Uh, and I, I don't know how you managed to turn half a day into uh, 30, 40 minutes. So thank you. And some great comments from people that have joined us here live today. And uh, yeah, it's great how people found that to be really, really powerful. I've taken quite a few notes. And uh, I really want to introduce, however, our speakers today who are going to join us on storytelling. <laughs>